Okay, Mr. Clark's back. Time to take a look at 12.8, the Harlem Renaissance. So as we go through, make sure you're answering each question to the best of your ability. Think about each question and response as we go through it. This will give you a good understanding of some of the major topics during this period of time. So the key objectives for this particular section for 12.8 will be analyzing how the Great Migration and the philosophies of Marcus Garvey and other African-American leaders impacted African-Americans in the 1920s. We'll trace the development of jazz and its impact on American society and the rest of the world. We'll discuss the major themes explored by writers and artists of the Harlem Renaissance. So if you look at the imagery even at the top there, you can see the Harlem Renaissance being emphasized. Harlem is a region of New York City. And a renaissance, of course, is kind of a rebirth or a re-emphasis here on African-American culture. Okay, so I go through, I'll read each question and kind of take you through some of the responses. So during the Great Migration, African-Americans moved north for many different reasons. We're going to characterize the reasons below in push factors. These are things that kind of pushed or drove people out of the South, kind of forced them to leave the South. And then, of course, the pull factors, these will be the factors that drew people into the North, kind of were things that attracted them or enticed them to move northward. So amongst the push factors that forced African-Americans out of the South, you have few economic opportunities. Of course, prejudice and segregation in the South was much worse than in some of the northern cities. Now, of course, segregation and prejudice, as we know, still exist today, uh, but it was a little bit uh, more challenging to back during this period of time. And to the degree in which uh, things like this impacted uh, society and impacted African-American lives uh, was quite, more, quite significant during uh, this period of time, the early 1900s. So when you think about the Jim Crow laws, we had discussed those previously. You had studied them quite a bit in the United States history one as well. Uh, Jim Crow laws are simply the laws that were designed to discriminate, segregate, and separate African-Americans from whites in the South. Examples of a Jim Crow law would be separate facilities for African-Americans and whites, separate schools, which was very prevalent in the South here in the 1920s still. Uh, buses, that'll be a big issue as you move forward. That'll actually be one of the things that's going to kind of move the civil rights movement forward. The segregation on the bus system is really, really where a lot of African-Americans will take a stance during the 1950s. Lynchings, these are the public hangings of African-Americans and others, those who had, were very supportive of African-American rights. You know, if you were a white supporter of an African-American, in particular in the South, you might be uh, ostracized and disliked and face almost as much trouble as uh, African-Americans might. In fact, they might dislike you even more seeing you as a traitor to their white supremacist cause. Pull factors, these are the things that attracted African-Americans to move north, uh, better paying jobs in factories, a much more open-minded region, more inclusive. City life, obviously if you're living in the south, a lot of the southern towns were um, quite a bit smaller, not much there in the way of offering culture and opportunities for African-Americans. Education, better, better educational opportunities for African-Americans in the North. Okay, I'll leave the push and pull factors there for you for a moment. Two, number two, how are Marcus Garvey's ideas different from those of W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington? So three of the chief African-American leaders during this period of time who were advocating for change for African-Americans were these three individuals. And we'll look at each three of their, each of their individual philosophies. So Marcus Garvey, he advocated what was called a back to Africa plan for African-Americans, believing they should return to Africa. He kind of had given up on America, the United States as an opportunity for African-Americans. He had over two and a half million supporters at the height of his uh, movement. He had the Universal Negro Improvement Association, or the UNIA. This is before he was arrested. He got a little bit out of hand in regard to some of the things he was doing. And as a result, eventually he got into some legal problems or trouble. 
And when he was arrested for mail fraud, his organization and movement pretty much fell apart at that point in time. His idea of black separatism did live, live on in terms of uh, a separate movement, the black power movement during the 1960s that we'll look at as we move forward throughout the school year. You can see some of the images down the bottom of the screen there. You can see Marcus Garvey pictured to the bottom right. Next, we'll look at Booker T. Washington pictured in the center. He believed African-Americans should make the best of their situation and eventually they would be more accepted into mainstream America. His quote, quote was, cast down your bucket where you are. If you kind of think about before I explain what that quote actually means. So if Booker T. Washington believed that African-Americans should cast down their bucket where they are, that means that they should make the best of their current situation. So by cast your bucket down, you know, cast the bucket down into, you know, a reservoir, an area of drinking, you know, a source, and you kind of fill it up and uh, you use that water as best you can, kind of making the best of the situation. And now, so Marcus Garvey had the most extreme, Booker T. Washington kind of uh, the most, I guess, laid back perspective, and W.E.B. Du Bois was kind of in the middle. He believed African Americans needed to be a little bit more aggressive in demanding equality and integration into society. Uh, Booker T. Washington uh, said to Du Bois one time, you need to be patient. And uh, uh, Du Bois you know, made a, a reference that the African-Americans have been patient for hundreds of years and then he's sick and tired of being patient. So you can see him pictured to the bottom left. Okay, next we'll move on to number three. In what ways did African-Americans continu continue to experience prejudice as they moved into the North? So as we look at these responses here, So a lot of these questions, too, you should think about the responses before I take you through them. So even before I scroll down so you can see some responses, you can kind of think to yourself and see how well you do in regard to the ways in which they are still facing prejudice. So hopefully you thought of a couple examples. So racism is still very prevalent in the North. Many African-Americans were forced in the cities to live in the slums or the most rundown areas of cities. Race riots occurred in the North, and there's been several examples of those that we've looked at. Question four, as we move into the jazz age during this period of time, explain why F. Scott Fitzgerald called the 1920s the jazz age. So once again, just kind of think about that for a moment. So this was an age of miracles, Fitzgerald wrote of the jazz age. It was an age of art. It was an age of excess, an age of satire. Jazz music best represented the decade of the roaring 1920s. Okay, question five, what groups, places, and events influence the creation of jazz music. African Americans are primarily responsible for the emergence of jazz music. Harlem became the center of the jazz age. Pictured below, you could see the Cotton Club where a lot of the great jazz musicians got their start during the 1920s. Six cite some examples of how jazz music impacted popular culture. Jazz music united African-American communities together. It gained African-Americans more confidence and respect within society. So as they perform, they got a lot of, you know, applause and a lot of people, you know, received their music quite well. They, you know, felt a sense of confidence during this period of time. Okay, the next section, the Harlem Renaissance. What tensions and conflicts characterize the Harlem Renaissance? Again, think of an example or two in your own mind. OK, 
Okay, an increasingly prideful and competent African American culture helped them to start standing up for themselves. Kind of was a kind of laying the foundation a little bit for the civil rights movement. And then a poem by Claude McKay. This prompted race riots in some areas of the country. And we'll look at a little bit more detail of Claude McKay in a moment. Okay, number eight, Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes were both important figures in the Harlem Renaissance. Think about how their voices and ideas conveyed very similar and different messages during this period of time. So think about where they might have some connections and where they might have some differentiation. So Langston Hughes celebrated African-American culture, where Hurston emphasized a much more independent spirit. You can see a picture of Langston Hughes here. Okay, next, we'll look at a little excerpt from Claude McKay's poem, If We Must Die. And I'll read it out for us, and you can think about the interpretation on your own in terms of what you think Claude McKay meant. If we must die, let it not be like hogs, hunted and penned in an inglorious spot. Or around us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their muck at our accursed lot. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men, we face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. And that's Claude McKay. McKay does not want African Americans to continue to accept segregation, intimidation, and violence. He advocates for African Americans to stand up and fight back. Ten, describe the most significant long-term effects of the Harlem Renaissance. I think for a moment what you think were most impactful. Okay. African Americans continue to make cultural impact in society and the arts and the music, gaining respect not only for themselves, but also from outside the African American community. Many whites and others within society embrace their music, their writings, their art. Confidence of African Americans increase, sparking additional protest and demands for equality. And like we do with any of our lessons, kind of reflect back on the, the lesson and the totality of it. Think about how the Harlem Renaissance helped to advance the equal rights movement for African Americans. And we kind of touched a little bit upon this as we went through our discussion. African Americans were no longer willing to simply accept their second class status in America. They found out if they united, they would pose a great challenge for those who wish to keep them separate. Okay, take a moment or so to get that down for yourself. And of course, your reflection here for the final one here could be a little different than mine. I don't necessarily need you to have exactly what I have typed up here. You can kind of include your own reflections with the lesson reflection questions as always. So I hope you enjoyed our discussion on the Harlem Renaissance. And until next time, Mr. Clark is out.